First Wednesdays is sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council and by the Kellogg Hubbard Library with video production supported by Orca Media. close to it. Okay. My directions for the night. Hi, my name is Rachel Seneschal. I'm the Program and Development Coordinator here at the Kellogg Hubbard Library. I don't think it's loud enough. Thank you for coming to tonight's First Wednesdays program. The First Wednesdays programs are sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council, and tonight there are programs all over the state of Vermont, humanities programs. People are talking about Frederick Douglass, daily life in pre-war Nazi Germany, Robert Penn Warren's All the King's Men, The Wyatts, Making Sense of the News, Local to Global, and other topics. I wanna to thank Orca Media for uh, videotaping tonight's program, and it will be on their website, orcamedia.org, I think. <laughs> Um, so you can watch it any time, and if you know of anyone who it wasn't able to make it tonight, they will be able to see it on Orca Media. Uh, we have community feedback forms in the lobby. Um, if you want to tell us what you like about First Wednesdays and perhaps topics that you would like us to have in the future, please fill out the form. Um, and there's a sign-up sheet or two on a clipboard going around. You can sign up if you want, it's not mandatory, and there are two on one side. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> um, the statewide underwriters for the First Wednesdays program are the Alma Gibbs Donchen Foundation, the Wyndham Foundation, the Institute of Museum and Library Services throughout the, through the Vermont Department of Libraries. The underwriter for tonight's program is Pomelo Real Estate. And tonight's speaker is Nancy, Crum, is Nancy J. Crumbine. She's a poet and associate professor of writing and rhetoric at Dartmouth College and a universalist Unitarian minister. She holds a PhD in philosophy and two master's degrees in philosophy and religion. She has lectured wi widely under the auspices of the New Hampshire and Vermont Humanities Councils, the National Council for Aging, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and religious and education conferences both in the US and the UK. In addition to her published academic articles, she's the author of Humility, Anger, and Grace, Meditations Towards a Life That Matters. Please help me welcome Nancy Cumber Crumbaugh. Thank you, Rachel. I'm so glad to be back here in this very room, 2009 was my first first Wednesday talk I ever gave, <laughs> and it was uh, the language of spiritual. And it was anyone there? Is the language of spiritual poets? Rachel was there. Yeah, somebody there. And um, <clears throat> it was on Rumi, uh, Kabir, Kenyon, and Dickinson. How I fit all four of those in? Don't ask. But um, there was a roomy enthusiast sitting in this very chair, and any time I quoted him or mentioned him, she would stand up. <laughs> Rachel's left already. I was hoping she'd remember. Do you remember this? She would stood up and go, yes. <laughs> so I invite you, if anything I say provokes such a response, to feel free to express yourself. <laughs> Um, I want to thank Rachel very much. Uh, this is the third time I've been here. I've also done uh, E.B. White a couple of years ago, uh, Evening with E.B. White. And I want you to put on your evaluation forms that you'd like to hear me my talk on Thoreau, please. <laughs> it's, this, it's the sister talk to this one on Rachel Carson. So I'd love to come back to do that. Uh, I want to thank Allie White, who has made all this possible this first Wednesdays. Uh, and of course, Vermont Humanities Council, my students at Dartmouth College, Henry David Thoreau, E.B. White, and Baron and <coughs> Janet Wormser, my dear friends who are putting me up 
and had to come tonight since I invited myself to stay at their house. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've given over 20 lectures uh, uh, of First Wednesdays over the last, since, since I was here. Uh, wonderful. I have a biblio, so on this table, um, um, a bibliography of Rachel Carson's work and also her uh, references, URLs for uh, things online there. And I encourage you to see the American Experience documentary about her on Netflix. I believe it's still on Netflix. And the YouTube videos that I've listed, one of them is the CBS report of May 1963, which I'll be talking about more later. But the, you can watch the entire thing, and it is worth watching the entire thing. It's really wonderful. Um, also, I've brought some books about her and by her. I haven't brought her collection, assuming the library has those. But I tried to bring the books that I th thought you might not um, have access to readily. <coughs> Two, two of those books I want to draw particular attention to. One is uh, Always Rachel, it's called. It's by Dorothy Freeman's granddaughter. It's a collection of the essays between Dorothy and Rachel, and they were the love of their lives to each other. And the letters are so moving. It, I mean, it's a rare collection of letters that you can just sit there and read. And this is such a book. It's really, really beautiful. I encourage you to... To look at, and the other book is a book about called Rachel uh, Carson and her sisters, and it's about all the women scientists before and during uh, si the writing of Silent Spring and all the support that she had. Uh, uh, it's it, uh, again a riveting book, not to be missed. A quick before we begin with Carson, I would just do a quick review of the times. Some of you may remember some of these things. The times leading up to this little woman from a poor, this poor polluted town outside poor polluted Pittsburgh, leading up to this shy, the times leading up to this shy, quiet woman writing a book that changed us utterly. This small Davidic voice, which took on the Goliath chemistry, chemical industry and the Department of Agriculture and began, it is almost unanimously agreed, the modern environmental movement. So we should start, of course, with the wild Unitarians in Concord, Massachusetts. <laughs> Thoreau, of course, more wild than Emerson, believing as he did that other species, including trees, had as much right to this earth as we do. Amen. Thoreau received one of the first copies of Darwin's Origin of Species, as you may know, in 1859. They're one of the first copies to arrive in the United States. He read it uh, thoroughly and avidly, wrote Darwin immediately, offering his services as a scientist. Darwin, at the end of that book, calls for help in verifying his uh, proposals, theories. That's not, neither of those words are right, but anyway. Uh, and you can see a change in Thoreau's journals once he begins doing all this research for Darwin. It becomes much more scientific, less poetic. It's a very really interesting shift. Or we could begin tonight with Calvin in the 1600s in Geneva, Switzerland, that great theologian against whom Unitarian Universalists still rant. Though in this context, his theology of nature, taken up through the Presbyterian roots of Rachel's mother, Marie, Maria, is very interesting. Nature is God's creation, according to Calvin. You've all read Calvin recently? <laughs> to degrade it, to degrade nature in any way is the sin of pride. The sin of pride, the very sin that Carson charges. <laughs> the very sin that, that, that Carson charges the scientists with, the sin of pride. Her entire life, her whole message, Carson's whole message, her whole life is a call for humility and wonder. So Thoreau, his journals at Carson's bedside, her whole adult life. She read them every night, read from the journals every night. And uh, so as my final reference to Unitarian Universalism, I do come by it honestly as though uh, Carson was not a churchgoer. She did ask that her memorial service be conducted 
by Reverend Howlett at All Souls Unitarian Church in Washington. Let me just lay out the grand work, really just quickly, just throw out some, some images for you, okay? Uh, of the times, the, the, the heritage, or the, the ground, the prepared ground on which she walked. Leaves of Grass, John Muir, Audubon Society, Henry Benson's The Outermost House, another favorite uh, book of Carson's. Roger Tro Peterson's Field Guide to the Birds came out in 1934, transforming our relationship to birds and, and very much increasing uh, avid bird watching uh, and, of course, the Audubon Society. The Wilderness Society, founded in 1935, um, and then, of course, the 50s and 60s. You remember? Anybody remember the 50s and 60s? DuPont, the darling of America, better things for better living through chemistry. Progress is our most important product. I was told, yes, General Electric, and I was told that Kurt Vonnegut worked for General Electric for a while, and he authored that phrase. I don't believe it. <laughs> but I've heard that rumor. Nature can, um, oh, so um, it, it is impossible to exaggerate the reverence for science and industry, in particular chemistry and weapons. They were the only things that could save us from the two most fearsome enemies in the 50s, insects and Russians. <laughs> Another favorite book of Carson's was John Kenneth Galbraith's The Affluent Society, published in 1958. And then the events leading up to the publication of uh, Silent Spring, the fire ants fiasco of 1957, 20 million acres sprayed with DDT by the Department of Agriculture. Quote, it reeked with the odor of decaying wildlife, killed everything in sight. And the fire ants weren't really very problematic, in fact. Then uh, you will remember the Dutch elm disease. I remember it well, the, spray, the trucks spraying the trees down the suburbs of Shaker Heights, Ohio. Uh, but partic and particularly in Long Island, the spraying, killing everything in sight. Um, and then strontium-90, remember that scare? Found in baby teeth in the dairy supply. E.B. White writes about the fallout in The New Yorker often uh, in several of his essays. And then the cranberry c contamination right before Thanksgiving in 1959, another national scare. Um, of the pesticides that were allowed to be sprayed only at a certain time and they were sprayed too late and so the cranberries were full of pesticides. In 1957, 6,000 different synthetic pesticides were on the market with no required testing. And then there was the thalidomide horror in Europe and Canada um, it was taken off the market in 1961. But it, you see, there's a lot of ignorance and fear going on uh, that leads up to the publication of this incredible book. And then, of course, the nuclear tests in Nevada in, in 62. And then there was Rachel Carson, scientist, writer, Hardest worker this earth has ever known, writing in severe pain all night long, racing against her own death to finish this book, Silent Spring. It was serialized in The New Yorker beginning in, the, in June of 62, and it was out by Houghton Mifflin as a book in September 62, uh, Paul Brooks being the editor, with the message of humility, the dangers of arrogance, the necessity that we understand the balance of nature, a call for ecology, which at the time was hugely controversial. Not the proper way to do biology. Her message that we are part of, not over and above nature, uh, was new to many, many people. It was a book about DDT, but it was about something much, much more, about the control of nature. So who was this woman? And how did she do this? How did she create this paradigm shift, this scientific revolution? And what I'd like to do is just go through a timeline of her life, just briefly highlight certain 
parts of it, and then talk a little bit about her three major works, three of her four major works, or five major works, um, and then uh, open it for discussion, because I, I, this, of all the talks I give, this, uh, a lot of people have a lot to say on this subject. Um, okay, so, does that sound all right, everybody? Born in 1907 in Springdale, Pennsylvania, along the Allegheny River. Her house is uh, still available to, I mean, it's become a museum, but my friend in, uh, who lives nearby said, don't, don't go. If you spend an hour in the house, your car will be covered with coal ash by the time you come out. So I, I still want to go, but it's... it's uh, at age 11, she published her first story in this incredible magazine called St. Nicholas Magazine. It was a part of the study nature movement that her mother was very involved in. It was a, it was a real back to nature movement, or not back to nature, but study nature. The importance of really understanding nature that her mother very strongly believed in as a spiritual commitment and that she passed on to Rachel who was in love with the woods and being outside and she was much younger than her siblings, so um, had a lot of freedom. Third child, children always have a lot of freedom because <laughs> the parents are so exhausted. Um, but St. Nicholas, um, I petered out on my second, but St. Nicholas, who, is, who else was published in the St. Nicholas magazine? And by the way, I have uh, this leather bound copy, is a copy that somebody gave me of the St. Nicholas magazine, so take a look at it afterwards. E.E. Uh, e. Cummings, F. Scott Fitzgerald. These are all published as children. Edna St. Vincent Millay, Elizabeth Bishop, and of course, E.B. White. She was in good company. Uh, and, and, oh, and Louisa May Alcott, and I think one of hers is in that volume that I have. So her first publication, she went to college at uh, Pennsylvania College for Women, which then was called Chatham College. Happened to be the first teaching job I had out of, out of uh, university. And um, she, there, she, there were two professors who were greatly influential. And since I'm one of, I'm a professor, and I like to think someday somebody will change the world because of my teaching. <coughs> that was a joke. <laughs> I want to name these people and give them a name. <coughs> Grace Croft, her English professor. Fresh out of Radcliffe, young, dynamic. They really fell in love with each other. <coughs> and of course, Rachel had always thought she would major in English. Sorry. But then she took biology with Mary Scott Skinker. And she fell in love with her as well and with biology and decided to go that route. But the English training she got from Grace Croft uh, stayed with her, and of course, the the Silent Spring would never have succeeded in the way that it did uh, had she not been such a fabulous writer. She goes uh, with with uh, Skinker's help, Professor Skinker's help. She goes to John Hopkins, and uh, after Chatham, and goes to Woods Hold in the summer. That was a big the first time she saw the ocean. She fell in love with the ocean just by reading Moby Dick. But it, I don't know, has anyone tried reading Moby Dick later? <laughs> but she read it and she, when she was really young and fell in love with the ocean. Um, interesting, that would be a fun paper to write, think about that. Um, but anyway, so she finally saw the ocean for the first time in Woods Hole and um, it was everything she had dreamt about and there she was. There she was. Um, so she, she was going to go on for a PhD but uh, family matters, lack of funds during the depression uh, required that she get a job, and she was hired by another man who should live in history, uh, Elmer Higgins, who hired her uh, to do some writing. And he said, I've never seen your writing, but I'm going to take a chance. And she, he asked her, so this was in 35 she began, and she worked there until 1951 at the fish, um, uh, the wild, oh, sorry, the Bureau of Fisheries and the Department of uh, Commerce. And as um, as a writer, a naturalist, um, 
able to quit in 51 because of the money from um, the sea around us. But Higgins, so she writes the first pamphlet for him and gives it to him. And he goes, oh, this is a little bit much for us. <laughs> you should send it to the Atlantic. <laughs> And damned if she doesn't do it, and it's published. The Atlantic, as you know, is Unitarian roots. I'm sorry, I had to bring that up. Uh, but it, it also has, uh, it was the place, uh, along with the New Yorker, to publish essays, uh, and it still is. Um, so that was the begin. that was her first publication, was this essay in the Atlantic, 1937. Um, so I'm going to just skip down to, then I'm going to just jump to 1941, her first book, Under the Sea Wind. Absolutely beautiful book, but it came out five days before Pearl Harbor. So even though it had fabulous reviews, nobody was about to read about the ocean in, those, in that period. So it really got lost. Um, it was republished later and uh, to great acclaim and still very much worth reading. My goal tonight, by the way, is just to get you to read Rachel Carson. Every single word is relevant, and it's it just as beautiful as it was then. She uh, became aware, she was very much aware of pesticides early on, and in, in 1944 wrote the Reader's Digest proposing an article about pesticides. And of course, they wrote back and said, oh, <laughs> nobody wants to read about pesticides. <laughs> and turned her down. But it kept, uh, and of course she didn't want to write about it either, and Dorothy, once they got together in 50, went, met and became such close souls, um, Dorothy didn't want her to write about it either, because it's tough. Although I just have to say that Paul Brooks said of this book, she man of Silent Spring, she managed to make this book about death a celebration of life. How beautiful is that? It's so true. It's really true, and that's that's a trick. It's hard to talk about these these days. It's hard to talk about anything with relationship to the environment, um, and make it celebratory. <laughs> okay. 1950. She gets breast cancer. Tumor is removed, and she's not told the diagnosis because in those days, the doctor told the husband. And if he didn't have a husband, he didn't tell anyone. <clears throat> 1950 to 51, the manuscripts for the sea around us sold to Oxford University Press. And by this time, she had this wonderful uh, um, editor, uh, Marie, who stayed with her uh, throughout, right to the end. Um, more on her later. Uh, See Around Us was a bestseller, it, off the charts, bestseller, Book of the Month Club, etc. The New Yorker agreed to publish it in chapters. Uh, it was very common. Uh, they still do that. Uh, and it was the first time a non-human a non-human subject was chosen for the prestigious column in the New Yorker. It's really interesting. Um, the sales of the Sea Around Us allow her to uh, resign and work full time as a writer. She received lots of awards, National Book Award, etc., uh, for this book. Uh, in '52, the family troubles really. Uh, escalate. She, her father died, um, had died. She had, so then she and her mother had to, or she financially had to take care of her mother and two sisters. The sister then had uh, Roger, her great nephew, her nephew. Is that right? Yeah. No, it's a grand nephew. It, the the sister had two girls, and then the girl had Roger. So anyway, Roger was born in '52. More on him later. Um, and she was able to buy, also from the proceeds of the book, she was able to buy her beloved property in Southport, on South West Southport Island in Maine, uh, off the coast of Booth Bay Harbor. And she builds a cottage there called Silver Ledges. 
And that's where she met Dorothy Freeman, who was the next door neighbor. <clears throat> and she began in 53 to work on Edge of the Sea, her third book, um, and delivered some papers and, um, and more awards, more talks at women's groups, uh, Audubon. And then 1957, you'll remember Sputnik. And that had a huge effect on her. She had long considered the ocean and space as sacrosanct, that human beings had messed up the earth, but they couldn't mess up the ocean. There's a passage that breaks your heart. It's so heartbreaking, I can't read it without crying, so I'm not going to read it to you, but I'll show it to you afterward. About how the oceans are, you know, the humans can't ruin the oceans, and they can't ruin space. But Sputnik changed that entirely. Um, and then the fire ants, she was very, very disturbed by the fire ants fiasco in 57 and the Dutch elm disease. And along with the Dutch elm disease of the spraying of uh, just of Long Island, just sprayed Long Island, were there were a number of people who were, of course, upset that there were dead birds writhing in their backyards. And particular people were Marjorie Spock and Mary Polly Richards, who were a couple, lesbian couple on Long Island, had a couple of acres of uh, organic gardening, and they were just their gardens were just ruined. It was sprayed 14 times in one day. So they joined a suit uh, with a principal, along with Robert Murphy, a, a suit that went through all the courts. It went all the way up the Supreme Court uh, before it was thrown out on a technicality. But the research of that court of, of that suit was provided to Rachel through Marjorie Spock, who's by the way the sister of Ben Spock. He was so tall. Did anyone? I had the privilege of meeting him, and he was like so. Tall. Uh, <laughs> the relationship of Marjorie and Mary's is interesting. Nowhere is there any reference to Marjorie Spock in any of Carson's works. She had to be very, very careful what, once she became so famous, and after The Sea Around Us, she was very famous, but then especially after Silent Spring. She had to be very careful because the chemical, after Silver, uh, Silent Spring, the chemical industry, of course, was after her. They were accusing her of all sorts of bizarre things, of being a communist, da, 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 da. So she had to be really careful not to be accused of being a lesbian. So she couldn't reveal these friendships. And that she had to be very careful not to be uh, considered um, uh, like she was just mad because she had cancer. So she kept her cancer, which came back um, with a vengeance in the early 60s while she was working on Silent Spring. She had to keep all that secret. Um, and she also was, a, was a very supportive of animal rights, and she actually did write an introduction to a, English, a book by an English friend, which was published in England. And this was really right at the end of her life. She did write that, but that was, again, that was a very possibly controversial issue that she had to stay away from it right in, up until the end. Uh, April 60s, she had a radical mastectomy and was very, very ill uh, through, throughout the writing of Silent Spring. The, the editor of New Yorker at the time, William Sean, she, by the way, I forgot to say, she wrote a letter to E.B. White when she was deciding that somebody really had to do something about pesticides, and she asked him to write the book. And he, in his wisdom, said, I think you should write it, Rachel. Um, anyway, William, Sh so E.B. White was still working for The New Yorker, but William Sean was the chief editor at the time and said that he would publish it in serial form before Houghton Mifflin published it. Um, and it was famously, um, it was famous immediately, it got incredible press. Uh, President Kennedy quoted it even before it was out in, paper, in, in book form in August of 62 when it was just out in the New Yorker. Um, and because she was so ill and was very, una really unable to, to do most of the speaking engagements she was invited to, uh, the, the staff biologist at the Audubon Society, Roland Clement, stepped in and took, did quite a lot of speaking and took a lot of 
the hits from, uh, you know, hate mail and uh, this chemist, chemical companies went after him as well. Um, so the CBS, I mentioned the CBS report that Eric Severi did. It was an it was CBS reports. Remember that it was a really wonderful news show. Alas, oh, um, Eric Severide, he decides to do that. He wanted to do it on Silent Spring, and he got Carson and then this guy from the chemical company, a very well-spoken scientist, but lucky for the environmentalists, he looked horrible on film. You'll see on the video. <laughs> he looked so ghoulish, and she looked so innocent and, and uh, fresh, although she was dying. Severide said that she, he was really anxious that whether he, she would even get through the interview. Um, But she does this, and so the, the book had sold a million copies by this time. Overnight, 15 million people saw this show. And it was, this was at the beginning of the power of television. What was the year? 63, April 63. And November of 63, the, the Mississippi River fish kill happened, validating, validating um, and giving a lot of support to the book. And let me just run through a few. So then Carson dies in uh, April of 1964, age 58. And posthumously, uh, her book, The Sense of Wonder, which is really the only book she ever really, really, really wanted to write, uh, which is a children's book. about. And she felt so strongly that, so take a look at this afterwards. She felt so strongly that that, that sense of wonder uh, was... And, and getting children out in nature was so very important. And I just have to say that I just, I love my students and they're wonderful, but there are so many of them who have just simply no relationship. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but it's so shocking to me. Just no relationship to nature whatsoever, like blank. Um, and I want to give them this book. Maybe I'll order many copies of him. Let's just go through what happened after her death. 1966, Endangered Species Act. 1968, the Grand Canyon Dams were defeated, the proposal for that. The Santa Barbara oil spill, 69, 69 also Greenpeace uh, is organized. 1970, the first Earth Day. DDT is banned in 72, Endangered Species Act, 73. Love Canal 78, et cetera. Um, I skipped over the Wilderness Act, sorry, 1964. And if you've ever been to Alaska, you'll know that that's the most important act that has ever passed. All right. That's the, that's the quick, quick summary. I want to share a little bit about these books. I want, I'm, I'm going to skip over the first one. I just want to do, how are we doing? Oh, okay, I have it here, sorry. Uh, oh, no, it doesn't show the time. What time? Where are we? 45 days. Okay, good. Um, I want to start with the sea around us. Well, I'll be brave. I will read this. I will read this paragraph. Man has returned to his mother's sea. Um, he cannot control or change the ocean as in his brief tendency on earth he has subdued and plundered the continents. In the artificial world of his cities and towns he often forgets the true nature of his planet and the long vistas of his history in which the existence of the race of men has occupied a mere moment of time. The sense of all these things comes to him most clearly in the course of a long ocean voyage when he watches day after day the receding rim of the horizon, ridged and furrowed by waves, when at night he becomes aware of the Earth's rotation as the stars pass overhead, or when, alone in this world of water and sky, he feels the loneliness of this Earth in space. And then, as never on land, he knows the truth that his world is a water world, a planet dominated by its covering mantle of ocean, 
in which the continents are but transient intrusions of land above the surface of all encircling sea. Um, and she goes on to say how he can't, at least he can't ruin the ocean. Oh. She was given the National Book Award in 1952 for this book, The Sea Around Us. How many of you have read it recently, or read it at all? Yeah, long time ago, yeah. Read it again, read it again. Uh, let me, I'd like you to read from the, her speech in accepting the National Book Award. And this is in 1952. And just enjoy her, her use of language. It's just, it's just, I feel like uh, uh, Carson, like I do about E.B. White, they're just this, it's really just best to read them, not talk about them. Many people have commented with surprise on the fact that a work of science should have a large popular sale because Silent Spring is a work of science, for sure. But this notion that science is something that belongs in a separate compartment of its own, apart from everyday life, is one that I should like to challenge. We live in a scientific age, yet we assume that knowledge of science is the prerogative of only a small number of human beings, isolated and priest-like in their laboratories. This is not true. The materials of science are the materials of life itself. Science is part of the reality of living. It is the what, the how, and the why of everything in our experience. It is impossible to understand man without understanding his environment and the forces that have molded him physically and mentally. The aim of science is to discover and illuminate truth, and that, I take it, is the aim of literature, whether biography or history or fiction. It seems to me, then, that there can be no separation no separate literature of science. My own guiding purpose was to portray the subject of my sea profile with fidelity and understanding. All else was secondary. I did not stop to consider whether I was doing it scientifically or poetically. I am writing as the subject demanded. The winds, the sea, and the moving tides are what they are. If there is wonder and beauty and majesty in them, Science will discover these qualities. If they are not there, science cannot create them. If there is poetry in my book about the sea, it is not because I deliberately put it there, but because no one could write truthfully about the sea and leave out the poetry. We have looked first at man with his vanities and greed and his problems of a day or a year, and then only, and from this based Biased point of view, we have looked outward at the earth he has inhabited. So get, let me just make this clear. So it's a new paragraph. We have looked first at man with his vanities and greed and his problems of the day. Then, and only then, from his, this biased point of view of me in the center, human, we have looked outward, outward at the earth he has inhabited so briefly and at the universe in which our earth is so minute a part. Yet these are the great realities, and against them, we see our human problems in different perspective. Perhaps if we reverse the telescope and looked at man down these long vistas, we should find less time and inclination to plan for our own destruction. The Edge of the Sea, her third book on the ocean in the preface gives such a definition of ecology, I wanted to read it to you. To understand the shore, it is not enough to catalog its life. Understanding comes only when, standing on a beach, we can sense the long rhythms of earth and sea that sculptured its landforms and produced the rock and sand of which it is composed. When we can sense with the eye and ear of the mind the surge of life beating always at its shores, blindly, inexorably pressing for a foothold. To understand the life of the shore, it is not enough to pick up an empty shell and say, this is a murex, or that is an angel wing. 
True understanding demands intuitive comprehension of the whole life of the creature that once inhabited this empty shell, how it survived amid surf and storms, what were its enemies, how it found food and reproduced its kind, what were its relations to the particular sea world in which it lived. She also in this book writes about the oceans getting warmer. This is, what did I say, 56? She writes about climate change. We've known this for years, folks. All right, Silent Spring. She's, as I've said, she's been troubled by this, uh, the DDT issues for a long time. Uh, but she gets a letter sent to her by Olga Hopkins, January 1958. It was a letter she sent to the Boston Herald about the mass poisoning on Long Island. And it was this letter that tradition at least has, has it as the, 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 the final push that got her to decide to do this book and begin this research. <clears throat> Um, in May of 58, Paul Brooks of Houghton Mifflin and William Shawn of New, uh, a New Yorker supported it. Uh, only Dorothy was very worried about it, as I've said, writing, Rachel writing a book about death. And, and, and they both knew that the industry would go after her, the chemical industry would go after her, never mind the Department of Agriculture, the gods of profit and production, quote, unquote. Um, The dedication. You've all read Silent Spring in the last year? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so the, there's a dedication, it's very short, and then there are two quotes. I'm going to read those two. So, to Albert Schweitzer, who said, quote, Man has lost the capacity to foresee and to forestall. He will end by destroying the earth. And then a quote from Keats, the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. And E.B. White, I am pessimistic about the human race because it is too in, 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 sorry, because it is too in gen, <laughs> blanking out, how do you pronounce this word? I'm sorry, I just, I, I'm, I guess I don't have my reading glass on yet. Um, I'm pessimistic about the human race because it is too ingenuous for its own good. Our approach to nature is to beat it into submission. We would stand a better chance of survival if we accommodated ourselves to this planet and viewed it appreciatively instead of skeptically and dictatorially. And that's how this be book, book begins. How many of you have read Silent Spring? Okay, how many of you have not? You have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, I want to say a few words, and then, um, you remember how it starts? Well, some of you haven't read it. So it starts with a fable, and this is uh, Marie Rodell, the editor, uh, is genius idea. It starts with a fable, so it has this prophetic tone right from the beginning. Um, there was once a town in the heart of America where all life seemed to live in harmony with its surroundings. And then she goes on to describe this idyllic town. It's so beautiful, a couple of paragraphs. Then she says, then a strange blight crept over the area and everything began to change. Some evil spell had settled on the community. Mysterious maladies swept the flocks of chickens, the cattle and sheep sickened and died. Everywhere was a shadow of death. And she goes on. Uh, in very specific detail. There was a strange stillness. The birds, for example, where had they gone? <clears throat> and then the final paragraph of the opening. This town does not actually exist, but it might easily have a thousand counterparts in America or elsewhere in the world. I know of no community that has experienced all the misfortunes I describe Yet every one of these disasters has actually happened somewhere, and many real communities have already suffered a substantial number of them. A grim specter has crept upon us almost unnoticed, 
and this imagined tragedy may easily become a stark reality we all shall know. What has already silenced the voices of spring in countless towns in America, this book is an attempt to explain. And then it goes on to be this incredible science book that I can read, and I can't read science. She, she has, the, the gift was that she was able to translate scientific studies and, and uh, scientific uh, examples uh, to an audience that could understand them. And in fact, she was writing mostly to women, to housewives. Um, a little bit more, well, let me just jump into that. Her, the style is lots, they're books, articles, books, so much written about her style in this book. But one, uh, this is from Alex uh, Mil uh, McGillivray uh, in, um, in a book called Manifesto, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. He writes about her style, and as much has been made about her alliteration, her metaphors, et cetera, but I thought this was pretty, pretty particularly interesting. One stylistic feature of the book deserves mention. Again and again, Carson juxtaposes ordinary housewives with men of science and business in her stories, because she retells the story of the fire ants. And the housewives speak at length, individually, in simple words, and are identified by hometown or name. By contrast, the, quote, control men, the cattlemen, the sportsmen, the chemical salesmen, the town fathers, and the federal field men are gray, faceless, unquoted, and nameless. The repeated use of this device, counter, count, counterpointing the personal with the impersonal, housewives with male technocrats, is one of the most mesmerizing features of the book, drawing in individual readers. Um, I tell my students all the time that writing is not a, a, a solitary business. Every book takes a village. Um, and it's so true in Rachel Carson's case. She, one of the reasons that she was able to write this incredible book is that she had this network of friends, scientific, sci scientists friends, who fed her the material. She would she, they sent her studies, um, helped proofread and double check and check again. Um, this vast network of people that were invested in this book. In addition, she had the women, particularly in particular women scientists who were very supportive of her and doing what they could for her. And she had her group of female friends, especially Dorothy Freeman, but also uh, Shirley Briggs, Jean Davis, who was her research secretary. I've mentioned Marie Rodell, the agent. And of course, Paul Brooks was amazing. Uh, mainstay for her throughout and ended up adopting Roger at age 10 when uh, Rachel Carson died. Um, pretty amazing man and wrote a beautiful, beautiful biographer, biography of her. Margaret Mead famously said, never doubt a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ha ever has. And so it is with, with Carson. Um, uh, you know about Rosa Parks and the bus. You know, the, the lot has been written about that too. The, she, no way the bus book out would have happened if Rosa Parks hadn't been connected with a million people in that city through her church groups, through her all these connections. And they, I, it's the same. There's a very nice parallel between Rosa Parks and Rachel Carson in this regard. The book is a call to action. It's not just a science book. She is very much uh, asking for uh, a response for us to do something. And at the end, uh, the, of, she goes through all, all these horrors. And she, at the end, she s makes suggestions. And she's very clear she's not saying to ban DDT 100%. She's not saying stop all pesticides overnight, uh, which is what the chemical company said she was saying. And th then they produced all this, uh, this fake science that's suggesting what would happen if we ended DDT. I mean, she was misrepresented, as you can imagine, over and over again. But, she, but the last chapter is her suggestions of what to do, but then she takes this final swipe at, at these guys, this, the chemical industry, and it's quite, and, I, and I'm gonna 
uh, read you that uh, at the end. Um, I'll read it to you right now. Um, how are we doing? Did we have a time? Good. So, um, I can't tell you how readable this book is. You won't be able to put it down. And it's, again, it is a celebration of life. It's just beautiful that way. So as I say, she, is, she brings you up back up at the end with suggestions of what in the, it is possible to make this change and, and dig ourselves out of this mess. But then she has to come back and get this one last punch. And so this is the last uh, two paragraphs of the book. Through all these new imaginative and creative approaches to the problem of sharing our earth with other creatures, so sharing the earth with other creatures, I have to say, is still a radical idea, at least to my students. When I suggest that it might be speciesist for them to think that human, for them to think that human beings are superior to other animals and have more rights than other animals, they don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, I don't expect they don't have to agree, but they don't even know what I'm talking about. The idea of sharing the earth with other creatures. Through all these new imaginative and creative approaches to the problem of sharing our earth with other creatures, there runs a constant theme, the awareness that we are dealing with life, with living populations, and all their pressures and counterpressures, their surges and recessions. Only by taking account of such life forces and by cautiously seeking to guide them into channels favorable to ourselves can we hope to achieve a reasonable accommodation between the insect hordes and ourselves? The current vogue for poisons has failed utterly to take into account these most fundamental considerations. And here she goes. As crude a weapon as the caveman's club, the chemical barrage has been hurled against the fabric of life. How beautiful is that? As crude a weapon as the caveman's club, the chemical barrage has been hurled against the fabric of life, a fabric on the one hand delicate and destructible, on the other miraculously tough and resilient and capable of striking back in unexpected ways. These extraordinary cap capacities of life have been ignored by the practitioners of chemical control who have brought to their task no high-minded orientation, no humility before the vast forces with which they tamper. The control of nature, quote unquote, which by the way, the scientist on the CBS thing that's debating her, he, he's openly advocating. That's what, we're, that's what science does. We control nature and that's what we're supposed to do. That's our destiny as human beings. She's, she writes, the control of nature is a phrase conceived in arrogance born of the Neanderthal age of biology and philosophy when it was supposed that nature exists for the convenience of man. The concepts and practices of applied entomology for the most part date from that stone age of science. It is our alarming misfortune that so primitive a science has armed itself with the most modern and terrible weapons and that in turning them against the insects, it has also turned them against the earth. And I'll close with a personal, this is just a, a small short paragraph from my journal, which I wrote in the midst of preparing for this evening. I am on the verge of tears always, even thinking about her. Her delicate features, her little body, bright clear eyes, all of which I know only from reading about her, staring at photos of her, imagining her working through the night, every night, until she could not. She seems so delicate, so elfin, and yet out of this fragile, dying woman comes this book, comes this stand against capitalism, against arrogance, in defense of nature, 
whom few understood to even need defense at the time. Out of this frail body comes voice, a condemnation of silence, not only the silence of no birds, but the silence of those who do not speak truth to power, who do not speak for those on this planet who cannot speak, the silence of complicity. And with that, I will open it for questions and discussion. Yes, sir. She's a remarkable, wonderful voice. She didn't win. There are still the chemical companies. There's still the Department of Agriculture. There's still something called the Environmental Protection Agency, which has been totally captured by those others. Bird populations are declining now more than ever. Insect populations are disappearing. Yep. One of the <coughs> most widely used insecticides for crops uh, is a neonicotinoid, which is a systemic poison, yep. which turns entire plants into poison, leaf, stem, sap, root, all poison. Yeah. So she's a wonderful voice. She set us on the right course, but it's not over. No, but it will. Who said it was? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I had a, I, I had a, I wrote a, uh, <laughs> Let me just read you something that I was going to, oh, uh, maybe I don't have it. So, anyone want to comment on that? <laughs> yes. I just want to add something, which I think this is the right group to tell this to. Vermont licenses the sale of six hundred and forty some neonicotinoids to homeowners which could potentially be in sale for sale in any garden store or hardware store. We are in the process of trying to look at laws that would reduce or eliminate the sale of those items to homeowners yeah. who tend to think more is better uh, and, yeah. and don't use them so um, there, uh, the, the, we, we are living in, in the darkest times that, uh, in my many years, certainly. But I, one of, what I wrote about earlier, and I can't find what I wrote, it's fine, but, um, is that birds were, were, I mean, birds were, literally birds were dying. It, things looked pretty bleak then. And if you read E.B. White on some of this, the, the fallout issues, et cetera. Um, so yes, they, they, they've only gotten worse. And of course, in the last two years, it's been, it's been beyond belief. Um, and uh, there are biologists that do, who say this, it, the game's over. Um, so let's just take the worst possible scenario that the game's over. Then, so the analogy I think of is, okay, my mother's dying. Now what do I do? I guess I'll just leave town because she's going to die. Might as well just leave. You don't do that, right? You, you, you give her your best shot. For, you get the best energy ever to have her last days the best possible. You, we have to look at the reality, and then we have to look at people that inspire us. And one of the reasons that I like giving this talk and we'll give it whenever I'm asked, and I've given it in different venues other than First Wednesday, is that Carson's courage, she's dying of cancer, she's in horrible pain all the time, she's being hounded and uh, crucified by the chemistry industry, she, she stands up and, and speaks before the Senate committee, Ribkoff's, uh, Ribkoff's, I can't pronounce anything tonight, Ribkoff's uh, Senate committee hearing on pesticides, she goes, does a CBS report, she does all these things, gives the talks that she can in utter pain and commitment to what her vision of, and she felt that she was the only one that could do this book. She really felt, she knew that she, she had the, the fame, 
She had the ability, or the writing ability, she had the connections to pull all this science together uh, and to make a, a difference. We, we just have to each find our, our niche, what we can do, and to, and to do it, and, and to pull each other up when, when the news gets us down. I was talking to Baron Janet tonight about this, this summer, I went to my cabin in Canada, and I, I was so addicted to the horrible news, I, I ended up ruining my three weeks of isolation <laughs> in my cabin because I couldn't turn the friggin' radio off. So when I got to England for a month, I got off the plane. I said to my British friends, I don't want to hear any, I don't want any news. I'm in a total blackout unless it's really good news, and they knew what that meant. <laughs> Uh, so it is important, it really is important to figure out each of us individually, and it's individually for each of us, how to, how to know what's going on, to be informed, and to figure out where your fight is, where, where, the, where the front line is for you, and, and to keep the fight going. Miracles happen, you know? Yep. We have bald eagles. Yeah. We, it, without this book, we would not have bald eagles, we wouldn't have robins. Yeah? I think we have to, what you just talked about taking a break, I think we all need to know that we can't solve it on our own. Right. And we do burn out, and we need to know when to take that break, re-energize, and come back. Again. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, <laughs> years ago I was talking to a friend who was working with the, the, the uh, sanitation workers in Boston, and helping them with strikes and organizing, right? And I said, oh, God, don't you get depressed? And she looked at me like I was crazy. She goes, why do I get depressed when I'm doing something? <laughs> you know, we get depressed when we're not doing, when we're not fighting. There's a wonderful book. You know uh, uh, Solnit's? Yes. Rebecca Solnit's work? Mm -hmm. She has yes. this great Hope in the Dark. It's a must read. It's a must read. Um, if I get the new director first Wednesdays, I'll have to work up a talk on her, but she's contemporary. So. But she, she talks about resistance and the importance of resistance, and it's important to not just look at the march in Washington and what the hell did that produce, but to see it in a long line of resistance. Uh, Philip Halley, the great philosopher who wrote about the Le Chambon, that little tiny town in southern France that saved 4,000 plus Jews during the war, um, he talks about how the, the, the we're in uh, this eye of a hurricane. That, that's what life is. And there's this destructive forces coming at us all the time. We're a little flugula, little bird <laughs> flying in the center. And that our job is to just keep pushing back the, the darkness, the, the hurricane. Just keep, keep pushing it back. Uh, but God knows there have been days where I couldn't say any of that. I've just curled up in a corner. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, well, we'll say thank you, first of all. Um, I think it's page 23. You have the book right there. Um, some other folks have touched on it already. The, Rachel Carson brilliantly highlighted our silo, I think she even calls it our, our academic silo mindsets and our stone pipe thinking mentalities. Those still exist. And that, that networking that you, that you highlighted was so important for her, but I mean, I'll give you a quick example. The Vermont 2016 five-year cancer plan. What can cause cancer for you in Vermont? Two things, sunshine and radon, that's it. Pesticides, no mention. And it's like, and when I, brought, wow. when I, when I bring this up to people at our state university, and it's like, you know, not that I don't respect anybody, but I get told that I live in an alternative reality. So hold that thought. When you mention to the, pet, the Pollinator Protection Committee, about doing their work and how they only wanted to address neonicotinoids, which was already mentioned. Yeah. I ask, you know, in a formal meeting, well, how come we're not including glyphosate, which has these effects, yeah. and how come we're not including atrazine, which has these effects? The question, my question was not answered, which is fine. The committee went on. The fact that I asked the question, why are we not looking at cumulative effects, appears nowhere in the notes. Nowhere, that it, it's like the question was never posed. So last year when I went to the Senate Ag Committee, I told Senator Starr and his committee, you aren't going to find about, out about this question because it's not in writing, but I'm going to read it to you twice here so you hear it twice. But that's an example of like no comprehension of you know, cross-pollinating between academic you know, yeah. areas or whatnot. But the, 
it just blew my mind that the question wouldn't make it into the notes. Yeah, wow. And then another powerful book you might, people might, might want to know about is Hal Ryan's book, um, The War Beyond the War on Invasive Species. She hammers on the idea of restoration. And we talk about being um, overly you know, hubris and pride and, and subjugating nature to our wishes. Um, restoration is like arbitrary and backwards looking as if we can wind back the clock and bring nature back to some previous condition like, well, I don't know, 1491 or whatnot. But I just had a conversation this afternoon. A fellow wants to restore a floodplain forest. And I said, you know, I've been telling you for six years, restoration is a meaningless word. You need to acknowledge that the landscape is damaged and depleted. Mm. Could we perhaps like rehabilitate it instead of playing this game of restoration? And again, yeah. So this isn't this isn't what you're talking about, but it does remind me. E.O. Wilson, have any of you read his new book on half the earth? I think it's called Half Earth. He's calling for a rewilding of half the earth. The only way we're going to survive is if we return. That's not restoration, I know, but return uh, half the earth to what? To wilderness. And everybody goes, oh, well, that's ridiculous. It's not possible. He claims it is. Of course, the, <laughs> just heard today, the population in 2050, the world population, 10 billion. Mm. We're at seven, almost 7 billion now. It, the, the human population has doubled in my lifetime. And in, in, it's not, that's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it. Okay. Um, but thank you for that. Thank you for that. You know, if we, it really is, is the sugar industry, the oil industry, the tobacco industry, all fake, all hired fake scientists, all messed with this stuff to tell us the climate. It, it just goes on and on. The horrors of the and and what's what's so inspiring about. Carson, she got the connection between the industry and the government and some of the academy. She got it. Yeah. And she got more and more radical about speaking out against it uh, as, we go, as, as she went on. Her, her last, one of her last speeches was to the Women's Press Club. Um, Well, let's, I don't want to interrupt. This is another great quote. Yeah. Well, Rachel Carson also spoke, spoke about the resi resiliency of nature. And, and I just, I know in Canada, when I've been up there, they have these interpretation centers. And at one of them that I went to, they had the foresight to show over millions, billions of years, the coming together and the going apart of the continents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was like the earth was breathing. Yeah, yeah. And we're here for such a short period of time, and we really don't know what's going to happen. So, but nature is resilient. And they don't wear the current, you know, you see in a turkey, it's not wearing the current fad. It's timeless. I mean, they're pretty much look the same now as they did 200, 400 years ago. And it's a wonderful thing to me to see that they just, they're kind of adapting to the world as it is at this time. And in the future, I mean, I think this is our own history. My perception is we could go down. They could go down with us. But they may come back. It will be different. But it's energy. And you can't just end energy. It's going to be expressed in some way. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what that is, so it's a mystery. And I tend to be more hopeful about it than that. And I think Rachel Carson is too. It's, it, it's, it's, it may be an end of a way of this energy being expressed, but it could come back and be something else. It doesn't have to be an end because we have the power to, to annihilate nature and it never come back again? Well, I, 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 can't, I don't know how to talk about this so globally, but she certainly wanted pesticides to stop killing birds. Yeah. <laughs> and other wildlife. I would say, yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of nature centers, uh, up in Alaska a couple of years ago, well, four, four years ago, um, and in the national parks and, and on the glaciers, and so, uh, and they show how it's receded. 
right? And so the narrator, the young uh, guy, what are they called? Naturalist. Naturalist. Do this whole talk about the, how they're receiving, receiving, receiving. No, no mention of climate change. Not a word. Not a word. Not a word. So I say something, and she sort of evades, and then but there's still a crowd, and so they all go. And then I go up to her, trying to be polite. What's going on? And she said, we have been attacked so often by people in these groups that, that how dare you say that? It's not mad men, blah, blah, blah. And these are young kids. They're, you know, they're, they're early 20s. Um, she said, they, they, it's a, it, we just have, we've just given up. We just have to be so careful what we say. It, and I mean, that, that really got me. <laughs> this is the federal government uh, not telling the truth about it. <coughs> Not you know, being being silenced by mob rule really. What time is it? I have to stop at eight thirty because you turn into pumpkins. Eight fifteen. Okay. Any qu any other questions? We can stop earlier too. But yes. I actually have a. I occasionally look at some of the. Um, Reports on climate change between all these great big committees. I look at them, and what if somebody wrote that decently? <laughs> yeah. 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 No kidding. <laughs> yes. Yes. Have you? I have not had a chance to read the latest uh, report um, that just came out last week or so. Is, has anyone read it? Yeah. It, it's true. We need another Rachel Carson. In fact, I am forever telling my students, star students, you're going to be the next Rachel Carson. It's so important. It really matters how things are written. It really matters. Words matter. Yeah, back there. Um, yeah, during your talk, you talked about how she was you know, ill when she was writing the book. And in her quotes in the beginning of the book, they were very pessimistic, like, the world's going to end, like, her world's going to end. Do you want to talk to, like, maybe the metaphor of her passing and her life ending and her seeing the possible world passing. So those quotes, yeah, that's a really great question. The, the quotes are uh, pessimistic, but the book is not. And so the, that initial thing is to try to wake the audience up to this is a real danger if we don't do something. But the book ends, uh, Silent Spring ends very high note that there are many things we can do, and she lays them out scientifically, what can be done other than mass spraying, and, and then ends on this high note. I, the, the chemical companies, uh, one of the reasons, I, as I said earlier, that she didn't want anyone to know she had cancer, was, well, first of all, they didn't talk about cancer in those days, and you didn't tell people, but she also was very, very worried that, the, that it would be used against her. Um, and so the chemical companies might go there, but I don't want to. She, she, I mean, I, she, she, I think she was, uh, apropos of the woman that spoke earlier, I think she was definitely optimistic. She, I mean, that, that the book would have it make a difference, and it did. It made a huge difference. We're in a horrible backlash right now. I mean, it's, there are no words for what, where we are right now. It's beyond what we could have ever even imagined. But um, we, we need to persist, and yet she persisted. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's not really a question. There's a recent article, an excellent article in the New York Times about the Armageddon of insects. And uh, it's sort of a, a statement of what's going on right now. And uh, it's Which is what? What is the Ar Armageddon referring the to? Apocalypse, I think. The apocalypse. The, the apocalypse, maybe, yeah. The so loss of insects? Yeah. The yeah. 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 Current. Current. So you can... Yeah, no, I'd like to, I'd like to see it. I don't know how I missed it. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Um, I wanted to just echo what Nona had said about the degree of and number of pesticides in our state of Vermont. Mm. And, um, and also to the fellow who said, but it's all being used. And you've said about Rachel Carson that her book awakened the public. It was a, a bestseller. Yeah. And to be really hopeful and echo what everybody else has said, um, 
I think she's cheering us on. She was successful in saving a lot of birds and in waking people up to the danger. And um, even though the pendulum has swung back, I think maybe it's swinging back the other way. And so we have an opportunity here in Vermont because there are so many of us that are paying attention. And yeah. if we focus in our own state yeah. and echo the excellent work that we're hearing, mm -hmm. like the apocalypse of insects and um, banning the use of glyphosate and atrazine and uh, neonicotinoids. Yeah. Neonics. Neonics, <laughs> right. right. So, uh, and, and just like on a positive note, I have to say, so two years ago we started hearing about how monarchs were in danger. This past summer, mm -hmm. I saw so many mm -hmm. monarch butterflies yeah. and chrysalises and such mm -hmm. an increase. So that when we do pay attention and we do speak out and we do take action, like you said, in our own little realm, it makes a difference. Yeah. The, the, the other thing to remember is, again, this is obvious, but if things aren't, when things aren't happening on the federal level, they are happening on, in certain states, and they're happening locally. And I have to tell you that a film that you must see, Rachel, you must bring it to the library, is, oh, she's left. The librarians always leave. Oh, no, there she is. Uh, <laughs> is this film called Tomorrow? Did anyone see it? It was at the hop. Like for, hey, has it been? So it's this young, these, these three or four young French couple, and they read this uh, article in 2012 about the end of the world, Scientific America, and they go, oh my God, the, the earth won't be here for my, our grandchildren. We have to do something. So they grab a video, uh, camera and they go around the world looking for where people are doing positive things. And this film is so joyful. It takes you to San Francisco, the waste treatment plan they have, which is amazing. It goes to Copenhagen and the bike paths. It goes to this little town in northern England called Todmorden, where a group of women are sitting around one day in despair, saying, we've got to do something. And they went to the town officials, and they said, we'd like all the vacant land in the town to be given to us, and we're going to plant vegetables. I was in England. After, a, a week after I saw this movie, visiting my naturalist friend, and said, where is this town? She goes, it's 40 minutes away. I said, we're going tomorrow. <laughs> okay. So we went, and sure enough, this town, every, every square inch is full, that there is no building, is vegetables. And there are people who are picking, people are working in them, and there's a sign that says, you know, help yourself. And they're organic, say that. <laughs> yes, yes, it's all organic, and and of course the Unitarian Church is behind. <laughs> what was the name of the book you mentioned? Hope in the Dark. Hope in the Dark. Rebecca Solnit. S O L N I T. She's a, she's all over. She's, she's written all right. tons of books. Uh, but this was a really, I, I couldn't put this down. I gave it to my book group and they didn't like it, but, <laughs> but that's their problem. Because it, it's a really great book. If you're an active figure, if you have any interest in changing the world, I think it's a great book. It's really, and it's very hopeful. I think it was one, it was called The Follow-Up to Silent Spring. It's, um, it's very difficult to read, crazy hard compared to Silent Spring. It's Theo Colburn wrote, um, our stolen future in 1992. Yes. Yeah. Crazy hard to read, but they talked about fish being uh, gender confused in England in the 80s, and we just saw that here in 2016 and thought it was the first time it ever happened on the planet. But I just wanted to echo um, examples, you know, Renee's thought on um, we need more role models, definitely, and they're out there, but the young people don't know where to look. Yeah. And yeah. people tell me all the time, my, my, what I do on the land is not peer-reviewed by PhDs and so forth. And I say, well, I haven't seen you out in the bush in 15 years. Yeah. And so the yeah. PhDs need to get out of the towers, to be perfectly honest. But King Arthur Flowers doing brilliant work, as an example. Yeah. I can name 20 towns in Vermont, so it's local grassroots yeah. that are trying to... They and we don't hear them. about them, so... We don't hear about And them. if we could hear about them, we, our, our spirits would right. be lifted. Great. And then, and then the, yeah. the CEO, or whatever his title is, at Gardner Supply, I, I asked him, I said, we're trying to save a lake here. Tell me you're not selling Scott's Roundup Ready grass seed. He yeah. said, no way, we're not selling anything produced by that company. No, in fact, Guy's yeah. Farm and Yard does not sell whatever product. I, I always check them every year. So I don't say good yeah. things about you and tell people to shop there, but not. But you make sure, tell me you're not kidding. Yeah. 
So I think this is a fabulous example of what we all need to be doing. We need to always be asking, asking, asking shops what they're doing, where their lines are, and, and really putting pressure. Yeah, it's a, thank you for that. Other thoughts? Any any thoughts back to Rachel? Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, That's all right. No, go ahead. Place. Wherever you want to go. I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that organic farming uh, isn't efficient. And it, it produces three times the amount of food per acre as other mm -hmm. commercial yeah. farming. It's just for commercial farming is about minimizing labor. And we don't have a problem with labor in this world. We have plenty of labor. People enjoy working on farms and producing food that way. But we make a, a, a terrible choice uh, with capitalism to grow food in a very destructive way. That's a good point. Amen. Is, um, yeah, there's the, food, the whole issue of food. The whole issue of capitalism. <laughs> yes. I, I got that in there. I hope you know this. I, I get in a lot of trouble doing that, but I do it. I think the point with Rachel Carson and her, her effect on all of us is that you need to step back and look at the big picture sometimes. It's, you, we get caught in our little micro worlds and don't see the big picture and the, and, and the, the consequences of that larger world that uh, we need to work on. Yeah. yeah. So um, if you, yes. I was just another thought of, since folks are saying articles that were significant, um, if you want a different perspective on hope, um, Derek Jensen's Beyond Hope is really interesting. And oh, good. it's really, it's just a different, it, a little bit of a different perspective. So I'm going to end with another upbeat thing. And I'm just going to take uh, the speaker's privilege to give this little advertisement. My oldest son, Jacob Crumbine, works for Impossible Foods. It's a startup in San Francisco that is making plant-based meat. And it is available. The Impossible Burger is available now in the Norwich Inn and at the Hop on Dartmouth campus. And if you call me or email me, I will take you personally out to lunch. <laughs> And penny where? Three penny serves, oh, here in Montpelier. Right. So again, I'm I'm saying this. Um, I'm joking about the advertisement. The, but the point is, there are a lot of things happening, and Jacob tells me about this. A lot of things happening with these startup companies that are coming up with with really important things. These are. This is not this. The Impossible Burger is for meat lovers. It's not for vegans. It's for people who can't give up meat, but they know. It's horrible for the beef, especially. It's horrible for the planet and horrible for your body. And this taste smells, cooks just like meat. So it, 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 the, the point is that this is just one little example of things that are happening that can help keep you void up. Maybe somebody could come up with an, a, a way to make food out of ticks. <laughs> <laughs> That's called a blender. <laughs> But we'll all be eating insects. We'll all be eating insects if there are any left. Thank you very much. You are wonderful.